happens when you get out of your lane? You begin to cause wrecks. And the natural, if you get into somebody else's lane without having permission, if you will, you'll cause a wreck. That's what will happen. If you try to make something happen on your own, you'll cause a wreck. So it's important. Stay in your lane. Do what God's called you to do. And do it with every ounce of your being. And watch God take you to places seriously that you never thought you would go. He will take you to places physically and spiritually you thought you would never go. I'm only 32 years old. I'm only 32, and I've been to Africa eight or nine times, Philippines twice, Mexico twice. God has taken me places that I never thought I would go. I've been able to preach, see deliverance come to people. It's amazing. So when you yield and you say yes, and I believe one of the reasons why I've been able to do as much as God's allowed me to do is because I said yes at a young age. It doesn't matter how old you are. I said yes when I was 18, and I was not fully surrendered, but I knew I had no other option. I still sinned. I was still a little rebellious 18-year-old punk teenager, but I said yes, and God took my yes, and he has just used my yes over the past 24 years. I mean, no, 12, 14 years from the time I was 18. Amen? 14 years, right? 32, is that 14? That's crazy. It's been that long. From my perspective, some of you are thinking, you have no idea. And I know I know. But just give them your yes and stay in your lane, even when it gets tough. The key when it gets tough is having discernment and godly counsel in your life to help you discern, has the grace truly lifted? Or are you experiencing spiritual resistance from the enemy? Does that make sense? Grace being lifted is one thing. And you know there's a peace in your spirit when the grace is lifted. But when you encounter resistance from the enemy, that doesn't mean it's time to do something different. Many people abort. They abort. What God's, they they abort the acceleration where they could be light years down the road at a young age because it got tough and they quit. Now the good news is the call of God is irrevocable. So even if you quit 30 years ago, the call is still on your life. Now it may look different than what it would have looked like 30 years ago. Obviously you can't go back in time and fix anything there, but you can say yes now. And God can take the rest of your life and do something amazing in you and through you. Can I hear an amen? Amen. So just say yes. Just say yes. Don't quit and just say yes. Amen. Thank you. You're awesome. You came back. You came back from Thursday night, even though I messed your name up. (laughs) You're awesome. All right. We're going to take communion at the end of our service, if you're wondering. Um, We take communion here at Oasis the first Sunday of every month, and we're going to do this at the end. I want to give people a chance to give their life to Jesus so they can participate in One of the coolest things we get to do as Christians, one of the most sacred things we get to do as Christians, and that's take communion. It's a holy thing. It's not just a religious duty. It's actually a beautiful thing. And so I want to give everybody a chance to get right with God. And um, what I want to do, though, is we're going to, we're going to continue on in our series that we have, uh, that we've been in on Sundays. And I want you to go with me in your Bible. I want you to go with me in your Bible, in your Bible, to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And I want to challenge you to stay engaged throughout this whole service. Stay engaged, lean into the Holy Spirit, and let Holy Spirit minister to you. How many of you guys are hungry for the Word of God this morning? 
There's a hunger and there's a desire to want to grow. Let me see your hand if that's you. I want to grow today. I didn't, I didn't come to waste time. I want to grow. Amen. I'm, I'm, this is something that if you're new here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, uh, what do they call that in like, in like TV shows where they give you like a, a quick rewind, a recap? I'm going to give you a quick recap on this. The title of this series, uh, and I know series are like really cool in America right now, probably everywhere, but I'm not like a big series guy, but God has us in a series right now, and um, there's so much to unpack here. It's like you got you to gotta make it into a series, uh, but I'm just ebbing and flowing with Holy Spirit, so I may, I may plan on hitting, hitting on something today that I don't fully get to that maybe we'll pick up uh, at, at a later time, but we also kicked off a series Thursday night titled Stewardship, and we talked about this past Thursday, stewarding your mouth. How well do you steward your mouth? Do the words that come out of your mouth line up with the words that are in this Bible? It's really important that our, our mouth aligns with the word of God. And when that happens, it begins to transform you. So you should come on Thursdays if you're able to make it. Do your best to be here. This Thursday, my wife and I will actually be leaving Wednesday to go to Eau Claire, Wisconsin at Oasis Church Eau Claire with Pastor Landon and Pastor Kristen. And they are uh, doing their third Hope Weekend since they've been there. And uh, they are believing for double of what they saw last time. Now, if you didn't hear what happened last time, it was just back in, was it February or January? It was just, it was just the other day. The other day for me could mean 10 years ago or like three days ago. But it was like back in January, February. I forget which month it was. It was cold though. And it's not as cold up there right now, but it's still colder than here. They live in the frozen tundra up in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. It was snowing while we were up there, and it was just, it's just a different country. But they're still in America, but man, might as well be in Antarctica, in my opinion. So we're going to Antarctica here in America on Wednesday. And um, if you didn't hear what happened, when we went up there, uh, my wife kicked off Friday night. Um, It's a series of services uh, starting Friday night through Sunday night. She preached Friday, I preached Saturday night, um, and Sunday morning, Apostle Barney and Pastor Landon tag team that morning deal because demons began to manifest Saturday night, and their church wasn't like fully used to, used to that, so they brought clarity to like letting them know it's scriptural and it's biblical and stuff, and uh, that was like a fun night, that was a lot of fun, and um, I mean, it was just like five to six people manifested. I mean, it was like loud and obvious, and it was, and then people got set free, and that's the best part of it, and so it was cool. Then Sunday night, there was like, what, 10? 10 people, man, if one, one person had 16 demons in them, and um, did that person get completely set free? Do you remember? Yeah? And um, it was just a supernatural weekend. Around 100 people either came to the Lord for the first time or rededicated their life. Lots of people got set free from from demonic uh, oppression and and demons and and got delivered. It was just a powerful, powerful weekend. And so they've invited us back up, my wife and I and Pastor Barney and Pastor Cindy, for their third Hope Weekend, which is happening this weekend. So we're going to be there. We leave Wednesday. And Kelly is going to be preaching Thursday night this week. Stand up, Kelly, because some people may not know you. Josh, you stand up too. This is Kelly's uh, husband, Josh. They are they they oversee all of our key leaders, everybody who serves in the church. They're an amazing couple. If you if you need to get to know anybody in this church, they're definitely a couple to get to know. And they're amazing. They're on staff with us here. And so, but she's going to be preaching this Thursday, still uh, talking about stewardship. You're not going to want to miss it. It's going to be a powerful service. And then her husband, Josh is going to be preaching Sunday while we're gone, next Sunday. So you want to be here next Sunday, and he's going to continue on with the series that we're in right now. So we're just going to keep moving forward, amen? And um, it's going to be a great week ahead. But I want to, uh, so be praying for us. Be praying for Oasis Church Eau Claire up there. And um, we, you know, I, we didn't know all that was going to take place last time we were there. And you just don't know. You just step into it, and then God does what God does, and it's just a supernatural thing, and it's great. So pray for us. We'll be praying for you guys while we're gone. And um, if you are new here, my name's Lindsay. My beautiful wife's sitting on the front row here, and we're the lead campus pastors of this campus. We have four campuses. This is the second one. Our main campus is in Rolette. 
and uh, with Apostle Barney and Pastor Cindy. We have a campus in Garland, and then, as I mentioned, up in Eau Claire, and then here in Caddo, where you currently are today. So if you didn't know you are in Caddo Mills, you're in Caddo Mills. So just so you know. But it's so great to have you here. If it is your first time here, thank you for being with us. We're honored that you would spend your Sunday here. We know there's lots of other good churches in the area you could be hanging out at today. The title of our series that we're in is The Kingdom of God, Your New Reality. The Kingdom of God, Your New Reality. Are you at Colossians? Because I'm not there yet, but if you're there, I'm very proud of you. You beat me there. And um, I've been up here talking, so that's my excuse as to why I'm not there yet. The kingdom of God, your new reality. How many of you guys know that when you say yes to Jesus, you get transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light? Let me do a recap for you. There's two realms. There's the natural realm, which we see with our natural eye. And then there's the spirit realm. And the Bible, though, the Bible only talks about two kingdoms. The Bible talks about the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. There's two kingdoms. There's two realms. When you give your life to Jesus, you get transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. The Bible says in the book of John that those who don't put their faith in Jesus, and when I say put their faith in Jesus, I'm not talking about what America a lot of Christians in America believe by putting their faith in Jesus by going to church once a year and, and then saying a prayer before they eat a meal. I'm talking about you are literally following Jesus. You are, the Bible says in the book of Acts, to be witnesses, and that word witness means martyr. You have to be willing to die for the name of Jesus. That's a true disciple of Christ. That is what it truly means to put your faith in Jesus. You are willing to die for him. That's the kind of faith I'm talking I'm talking about biblical faith, not like what, a lot of Americans believe, do you love Jesus and do you know him? Oh, I know him, yeah, I think I'd go to heaven. But I don't, I, don't, I know about, a lot of Americans know about him, a lot of Americans don't know him. Does that make sense? Right? So it's, a, and the way you get to know him is through intimacy. It's through, it's through not just a prayer list, it's through actual, I give my life to you. And then he takes you on this amazing, exciting journey of life in the spirit. Now, we still see with our physical eyes, and we still see this natural realm, but you're a spirit being. Thessalonians tells us you're a spirit being. You're made up of spirit, soul, and body. You're a spirit being. You have a soul, and you live in a body, all right? So this body does not control you. Your soul doesn't even control you. It's actually your spirit being. That's who you really are. And when your soul is out of whack, this is when you realize, I've been living life in the flesh, not out of my spirit, man. And you've got to re-identify with your new nature. You have an old nature, and this is the nature that you were before you met Jesus and before you gave your life to him. And then when you gave your life to Christ, you became this new nature. You have a new nature. The Bible calls it you're a new creation. Paul says in, in Galatians, the only thing that matters is you being transformed into a new creation. Your new nature is your spirit, man. Somebody say, my new nature is my spirit, man. You become a a immortal being, the moment you said yes to Jesus, the moment you said, Father, forgive me in my sins. Jesus, wash me with your blood. I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth that you are Lord and Savior. Boom, you became a new creation. So now you're a spirit being now. You're no longer bound. You're no longer bound to what you see with your natural eye. If God says in his word, you can have it and it's for you, then you can have it and it's for you. Amen. Amen. You got transferred from an old, from, from, from not an old kingdom, but a kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light now. And that kingdom of light is the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God has to become our new reality. It's not just reading Bible verses that are encouraging. It's actually allowing the word to transform our soul so that on this side of eternity, we can accomplish everything God has in store for us to accomplish and we can attain everything God has enabled us to contain. In the old covenant, which is, which is not as good as the new covenant, the old covenant, Deuteronomy, I think, chapter 28, talks about different blessings that, that they had in the old covenant. Well, how much better is the new covenant than even the old? The same blessings in the old covenant transfer over into the new covenant, and in the old covenant, the Holy Spirit came upon people, but in the new covenant, the Holy Spirit comes into people. Who is Holy Spirit? It's God's presence. It is God himself coming into people. These physical bodies cannot contain the fullness of the glory of God. Can't do it. It would kill your, it would physically destroy your body. When Moses wanted to see God, 
God did not allow Moses to see him face to face because it would have killed him. So he let Moses see his backside. And after that moment that Moses had with God, seeing his backside, his, his face glowed like a light just from seeing the backside of God. Now let that sink in for a moment. How much more radical would it have been? It would have killed Moses if he would have saw him face to face. Your physical bodies cannot contain the fullness of the glory of God. These physical beings cannot contain it. But you're a spirit being now. Those of you in this room who've said yes to Jesus or you're watching online, you are a spiritual being. Now, you are immortal, the Bible says. These bodies are gonna go back into the ground. They're gonna return as dust. They were made from dust, right? But who made the dust? God. All right, so we're talking about your new reality. We're talking about your new reality. Colossians chapter three. I said Colossians one, didn't I? Go to Colossians chapter three. Verse one, since you have been raised to new life. Somebody say new life. New life is a new creation. You're a spirit being now, all right? It says, since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. In other words, focus on the realities of heaven. Now, Jesus said, Scripture will not contradict one another. Just just side note, Scripture won't contradict, all right? Jesus told his disciples, before the Holy Spirit even came into them, Jesus was telling his disciples to pray a specific way. The prayer was, let your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's important to understand this, on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, you fast forward to Colossians 3 verse 1, set your sights on the realities of heaven. It's the same thing. What is, what is God trying to tell us? What is, what is the Father's heartbeat for us? What is in heaven we can walk in on earth? This is what the Father's trying to tell us. The Bible says in Ephesians, you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. How is that possible when you're physically sitting here? Your physical body isn't in heaven, but your spiritual being is seated with Christ because Holy Spirit lives on the inside of your spirit man. Are you with me? What is filled with heaven? The presence of God. What is on the inside of you? The presence of God, Holy Spirit. It's important to understand this because if you don't understand that you have access to everything heaven has for you, then you will walk a limited life on this side of eternity. You don't have to live one more day sick. You don't have to live one more day broke. But it's not even just about the blessing of the Lord. What's even greater is the revelation of who Jesus is himself. God wants you to have a greater desire to want to get to know Jesus than it is for anything else. When you get to know Jesus, healing comes to your body. When you get to know Jesus, finances follow you. Blessing comes to you. When you get to know Jesus, you want to walk like Jesus walked. The Bible says, as Jesus is, so are we. God's heartbeat for us is to make us more like Jesus. Not make us, not not make us Jesus, make us more like Jesus. Not make us Jesus, make us more like him. Like him. Like him. So the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus says, seek two things. Out of everything he could have said, he didn't say three things or five things. He said, I want you to seek two things. And the two things that you're called to seek is the kingdom of God and the Father's righteousness. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. Here it is again. The kingdom of God, your new reality. Why does Jesus, out of everything he wants us to seek, why does he want us to seek the kingdom and seek righteousness? Why is that? Before he tells us to seek kingdom and before he tells us to seek righteousness, he talks about don't worry about what you're gonna eat. Don't worry about the clothes you're gonna wear. Don't worry about the drink you're gonna put in your stomach. Stop worrying about the natural physical things. Seek the kingdom first and his righteousness and then all these other things will be added unto you. Does God not take care of the birds in the air? Does God not Does God not real, see every dead sparrow that falls to the ground? God will... So much even more take care of you, the Bible says. What's the point? The point is this. Stop living by what you see only in the natural. Now, if you're going to drive on this highway, please open your eyes in the natural so you you don't get in a wreck and kill somebody and kill yourself. All right? 
there are physical, there are physical things we got to do with our natural. I got to hold this microphone in my natural hand to be able, so you can be able to hear me better. There are physical things, but what's the point? The point is this: my desire and my heart is after the kingdom and is after righteousness. What is righteousness? When you look up righteousness, righteousness simply means your identity in Christ. Who are you in Christ? In other words, who are you as this new nature? Your identity in Christ is the spirit man. That's your new nature. Who are you? What are you capable of? It's like putting on an Iron Man suit and you don't know all the gadgets. You don't know you can fly unless you've been told you can fly. You didn't know you could shoot missiles out of your hands unless you've been told you can shoot missiles out of your hands. There's many people that have this powerful new nature. But because they're so driven by fear and the things they see with their natural eye, they don't tap into their new reality. If you want well out of the earth, you got to tap into the oil. I mean, if you want oil out of the earth, you got to tap into the ground. You got to tap into the ground. You're going to have to focus and seek. What does seek mean? Seek. Seek. Seek the kingdom of God. Seek the kingdom of God. Seek. Seek. Seeking is not begging. I'm not texting anybody, don't worry. Seeking is not begging. I'm just, I'm going to tweet something real quick. No, I'm not, I'm joking. Seeking is not begging. I'm looking something up. Seeking is not begging. I know most pastors have their notes already mapped out. Most of the time, I do not. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek. Are you ready to know what seek means? Seek in the Greek. Didn't mean to rhyme, but I just did. This is what seek means. I would write this down. Seek means this. Seek in order to find. When you lose your keys, do you just stop? Well, can't find them. Guess I'm not going to go anywhere today. Guess I'm going to miss all my appointments and starve and die right here in my house. You know if you don't seek those keys in order to find them, then you will wind up being limited. It will hold you back. It will slow you down. How many believers are not seeking the kingdom and they blame God for why their life is not moving at the rate of the kingdom of God. Because they're not seeking in order to find. What they're doing is they go to God one time. They look look in the same drawer they thought their keys were, and then they just give up. Well, I guess God doesn't want me to have it, and I guess it's not for everybody. You looked in one drawer. You knocked one time. You ask God to give it to you right now, and if you don't, you're not real. And then you based your whole theological point of view of God because he didn't grant you your one wish within the five minutes that you, 30, 15 seconds you asked him. I didn't want to give anybody the benefit of they prayed for five minutes because a lot of people just pray for like 10 seconds, and when God doesn't do it, they just, okay. Well, I guess, that prosperity gospel, they just want your money, Oh, they looked in the drawer and they flipped up one cushion. Sorry, I'll give them credit. In other words, they prayed one time and went to church one time, and then God didn't answer all their dying wishes, so they just give up. The Bible says seek in order to find. You are pursuing this thing. You are going after this thing. Everything else becomes irrelevant. Everything else. You can go to work, and on the inside of you, you're craving kingdom. During your lunch break, you are dissecting the word. You're praying in the Holy Ghost throughout your day. You're looking for opportunities to minister. You're looking, you're you're just hungry for kingdom. You're seeking in order to find. It means, you ready for this? It means to require or demand. God, I want your kingdom. I want your reality to become my reality. This is what it means to seek. Well, I I gave tithe one time and I sowed and one time and nothing happened. 
So I guess, I guess God doesn't come through for everybody financially. Okay, well, you just, you just took a weed killer, and what you did was you just poured it on your seed, and now God is not bound to come through for you financially. Anytime we disobey, God is not bound to come through for us. He is not bound to fulfill his end of the deal if we choose to live in disobedience. If there's unrepentant sin in our life, God is not bound to rescue you. He already sent the rescuer. It is up to us to say yes and yield to Jesus. It is not up to God to prove himself like a genie in a bottle before we put our faith in him. He already proved himself through the work on the cross. It's arrogance to think God has to prove himself again. He already proved himself. Seek in order to find a hunger and a desire. There needs to be that hunger on the inside of you. What you feed, you gain an appetite for. Or what you feed yourself, you gain an appetite for that. So what are you feeding on? What are you feasting on? What are you seeking? What are you pursuing? If the majority of your week, 40 hours of your week, is solely focused on work, and you are putting all of your time and effort and energy into something natural, then I will tell you this. What you sow is what you will reap. If you're focused on natural things, you will reap a natural mindset. But when you focus on spiritual things, while you're doing natural things, you will begin to walk in a kingdom reality called God's kingdom, and there will be an acceleration that comes to you because you're letting God know, I hunger for this. I thirst for this. I desire this. So seek means you seek in order to find. It means you put a demand on God, not from a place of telling God what to do, but letting him know that you are hungry for everything he has for you. I want to know kingdom. I want to know everything about the kingdom. I want to know everything that's in heaven. Jesus, you said I'm supposed to pray that here into the earth. So I will not tolerate sickness. I will not tolerate sin. I will not tolerate bad attitudes. I will not tolerate brokenness. I will not tolerate poverty. I will not tolerate. When you get an understanding of kingdom, then you realize that kingdom now is a part of your identity. Seek first the kingdom and righteousness. Righteousness is your new nature. That is, that's who you are. Who are you in Christ? Well, you're seated, you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. Holy Spirit, what does that mean? Boom, Holy Spirit is on the inside of you. Holy Spirit is the same spirit that Jesus has, life-giving spirit. It's all spiritual transactions happening right now. If, if you're crazy enough to believe that a woman named Mary did not have sex with Joseph, and God impregnated Mary and gave birth to a, a baby named Jesus who grew up to down a cross for your sins so you can have eternal life with Jesus, that is, that is no less crazy than to believe that I can receive my healing now. That is no less crazy to believe I can walk in everything God's called me to walk in. Come on, don't let the devil talk you out of exactly what God has promised his children. Watch this crazy talk. Well, right back at you. You believe in a virgin birth. That's crazy. Well, you believe that a man died on the cross and that's what took all your sins away? You weren't there when he died on the cross. How do you know he actually died on the cross? Oh, but we're so concrete to believe that. But it's heresy to believe that I can have healing now. It's heresy to believe that I can pray in the Holy Ghost. It's heresy to believe that there's apostles and prophets today. It's heresy to believe. It's heresy to believe that I can be debt free and walk in financial overflow and not be bound to limitations of whatever kind of inflation the government wants to put on America. Which one's crazier? They're both crazy to believe. Why stop at a virgin birth? I'm just going to go all in and believe it all. Amen. Hallelujah. That's called natural mind. That's called human reasoning. 
But when you know you're a spirit being and you begin to read the word through spiritual eyes, this is what happens. This is what happens. I wish, I, I wish I'd taken time to actually like, this analogy hit me this morning. So I didn't have like a whole bunch of time. So this, this morning I was thinking of, anybody have to wear glasses like your vision's really bad? bad. My, my wife's vision in the natural is like, you put her glasses on, you're like, you, good luck. You'll get nauseous really quick by trying to look through her, look through her glasses. Like real blurry. So this is what happens. People put on their worldly glasses and their vision's blurry. They put on glasses that were never meant for them to put on. And then they complain to God as to why God's not doing what the Bible says God can do. So now they're walking around, running into things, jacking with other people's lives. They can't see five feet in front of them, all with a tip on their shoulder as to why God, if God's real, then why they have worldly glasses on and they're bumping into stuff. In order for you to receive everything that God has for you to receive, remember, pray your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? Where's earth? Poof, you're here. You're in earth. This is it. Welcome to earth, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to earth. You're here. And Jesus said to pray what? Your kingdom come where? Your kingdom in heaven to come here. Boom. Is there sickness in heaven? Is there poverty in heaven? Is there heartbreak in heaven? Is there sin in heaven? Is there homosexuality in heaven? Are people confused about their identities in heaven? Is is there there anything crazy going on in heaven right now that represents the kingdom of darkness? And Jesus said to pray what? Your kingdom come where? And where are you? Your earth. And then Jesus says to seek what? His kingdom. What does seek mean? In order to find. I will seek it till I find it. I will pursue it. Now here's a little secret. The moment you encountered Jesus and said yes to him, you ran smack dab in the kingdom. Jesus is kingdom embodied. Jesus is God in flesh. It's kingdom embodied. That's how easy it is. It's not complicated. It's not difficult. It's not challenging. It's really easy. All you have to do is believe, just like Peter Pan. All you have to do. Seek in order to find, require, put a demand. Time flies, don't it? Man. Seek also means to crave. Demand something from someone. To crave. To crave. To crave. Now, I planned on talking about two different things today. Not this one. But while I'm on this topic, I mean, it's the same series. I just plan on hitting on two different points separate from this. With this, two different points. I'm actually hitting on a different point that I had in this that I plan on talking about later. But since I'm on this point within this series, I'm going to talk about this point and drive it home even further. You guys good with that? I plan on talking about vision and values, and I plan on talking about the reliance on the Holy Spirit. And in Jesus' name, God willing, I should say we'll get to it. But what I want to talk about right now is the same point. Now, I want you to go with me in your Bibles. Well, hold on. It says this. Go back to Colossians chapter 1 just so we can finish this. And this... You need to take this first and I'm kind of hesitant. I don't want to offend anybody. Yeah, I won't say it. Okay. I won't say it. You need to take this verse and either get a physical tattoo of it on your body or go to wherever CC's gets those fake tattoos that they put in the machine and have somebody, and you can just fake, and that way you can wipe it off in the shower. Like it's not, yeah, that way it covers across the board there. The water tattoos. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven 
where Christ sits in place of honor at God's right hand. Now, I think about hunting when I see this word sights. I'm not a hunter. Never been hunting in my life. Don't care to hunt. I would like to kill a hog at one point in my life. That'd be cool. Feel like a man. <laughs> right? So, Josh invited me out through the night. Eh. I just have to be in the mood. You know what I mean? You just got to be ready to go. You just got to be ready to go. You know, you're like, eh. Say the other night. Yet again, that was like last year sometime, I think, when he invited me. It wasn't just like the other night. So, when you, for, for those hunters out there, I do understand this about hunting. If you have a scope, let me just ask so I don't look like an idiot up here. Do you have to like set the scope like you've got to like adjust the sight on it? That's a thing, right? Okay. That's a thing. You have to adjust it. You got you to adjust it. Set your sights. Set your sights. You need to take off those worldly glasses and say, Lord, let me, let me see what you see. Help me tune in to my spiritual eyes. Now, all right, my new friend Jonathan, raise your hand. We had dinner with him and his lovely wife this past Wednesday night and um, at a miserable restaurant called Sawgrass. It's terrible, never go there. We, uh, I'm kidding, just joking, it's a great restaurant. We like to eat here a lot. But we had dinner with him the other night and Jonathan, his first Sunday to church, um, God highlighted him to me. I'm making a point with this. I just knew that I knew that this guy had, there was just, I just knew in my spirit, this man has been in ministry before. I just saw it on him. Now, how are you able to see that on somebody? How was I able to see, how was I able to see that on somebody? By the spirit, my spiritual eyes. You can look at people and you can discern and pick up. They're dealing with depression. They're, they're dealing with pain. They're going through something intense right now. Whenever you're out and about and you start getting these, what may seem to you crazy thoughts about somebody in front of you, they're not crazy thoughts. That's Holy Spirit talking to you. That's what happens. Did you know demons have smells to them? It's wild. I don't know that I ever smelt a demon or not. I smell something bad, I usually blame it on something naturally. (laughs) And I'm not talking about me passing gas, okay? My wife's looking at me like, yep. I'm talking about you just walking down a hallway and you smell something. And I know the whole expression, never smelt it, dealt it. That's not what I'm talking about. (laughs) But how do you know that what you're smelling when you walk by somebody at work, you pick up an unusual scent? Maybe it's a demon. Very interesting. Who knows how many spiritual encounters you're actually having on a daily basis and don't even realize it because you haven't been taught it and you can't walk in what you haven't been taught. Very interesting. If you want to grow in things of the kingdom, then you've got to seek things of the kingdom. Set your sights on reality. You've got to adjust. I woke up this morning feeling very carnal. In other words, I was really tired. I woke up this morning just tired. Anybody else wake up this morning tired? A few of us. Everybody else is lying? Okay, that's fine. I'm kidding. I woke up tired this morning. I didn't feel spiritual at all. Not one ounce of me felt spiritual. Matter of fact, the opposite. I didn't feel spiritual at all. But I had to reset my sights. What does that mean? I had to refocus my thoughts. I am spirit. I am a spirit being. And when I began to do that, boom, peace came to me. Isn't that amazing? Nobody had to pray for me. Pastor, I don't feel like a new creation today. Set your sights. Refocus your thoughts. Focus less on what the devil's doing and focus more on what God's breathing on. Why would you want to focus more on something that is hot? It's like when you have the opportunity to go into a desert and get scorched by the sun versus go to the ocean where there's a nice cool breeze. 
Whatever you focus on is what you'll wind up pursuing. So if you're focusing on everything the devil's doing, you're going to go into like warfare attack mode, and you're going to get drained. But when you focus on what God's breathing on, and you know who you are in Christ, your, your, your identity, your right, your, you're righteous, you're right standing with God, then you're going to walk around the way Jesus said we could walk around. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Why do you look like you've got no worry? Because I ain't got no worry. With everything going on, even in Ukraine, oh, my heart goes out to Ukraine. I pray for Ukraine. I just found out yesterday we have a missionary over in Ukraine. Not, not Oasis personally. We're, we're an Assembly of God church. We have a missionary over there in Ukraine. I'm, I'm concerned for sure. I'm not worried. I just heard, I just heard uh, yesterday that there's a potential of uh, a wheat shortage because we get our wheat from Russia. Well, guess what we're not going to be getting from Russia anymore? Wheat. What's that going to do to wheat here in America? It's going to cause bread to become more expensive. Cereal with wheat and grain in it apparently is going to go higher. Now, in the natural, you can allow it to freak you out. You can leave today and go buy 60 pounds of bread, and that'd be moldy by the end of the, end of the week. That ain't going to do you any good unless you freeze it. You could do that. Or you can say, you know what? God's got me. Now, if you don't have seed in the ground, if you don't tithe, I would be concerned. If you ain't got no investment in the kingdom, I would be concerned. If you think tithing is foolish, let's see how foolish you think it is. Whenever inflation's so high and people who are tithing and sowing and giving or living an abundant life becoming debt free and you're drowning in debt. You're having to ask people, can I live with you? Come on. This is going to happen. There is a prophetic word that was released. I don't know who it was from, but Apostle Barney was telling us about it. But there's going to be churches throughout America that are going to close down. Churches throughout America that are going to close down. I'm assuming it's throughout America. But there's going to be churches that close down. Churches that they did not build the church on Jesus. And God gave me a dream just this past week, another dream, about there's going to be ministries that get in wrecks. Ministries, in other words, they're going to close down because they're, they're not going after Jesus. Maybe it's personal gain. Maybe they're sinning the church. I don't know. But when you build your life on Christ, you don't have to worry about going down when storms come. Matter of fact, God expects the opposite out of a believer. He expects you to soar when a storm comes. But if you're looking with your natural eye, then the potential of you going under is very great. Peter walked on water, true story. It's not just a cute little parable. It's an actual event that took place in history. They got video footage of it. Just a joke. I thought that was funny. Go to my YouTube channel, and you will not find Peter walking on water, but what you will find, no, I'm kidding. It's an actual event that took place. Why did Peter start to sink? He began to look at the natural. Fear. So if you have no investment, absolutely, you may find yourself having to work four jobs to stay afloat. You'd be very stressed, but you don't have to be. Amen? You don't have to be. I don't say this to brag. I say this because in the natural, it's, it's easy to look through your natural worldly glasses. God led my wife and I into building a house last year, not knowing all this crazy stuff that's going on in our world. And you know what? I'm not worried. I ain't worried. God ain't like, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead you into this. And then, boom! leave you. Now you're on your own, buddy. Now, if you go out and do something on your own, and God did not lead you into something that's costing you a lot of money, then, yeah, you might want to get out of that party right there. 
I want to get out of that boat, get into God's boat. Can I hear an amen? But if God's leading you, he will take care of you. He will provide. He will provide. He will provide. He will provide. He just comes through. It's supernatural what God does. But if you don't give him a chance to work, and you only stop at believing in the work on the cross, and you don't begin to unpack all the work that was done on the cross, John G. Lake, one of the generals in the faith, his wife died, his first wife died. You know why? Because she was malnourished, uh, what is that word? Malnourished, huh? Malnourished. My wife was throwing me off. She was malnourished. You can be a Christian and still die of starvation, but you don't have to. There is a well-known minister who packed his plane too heavy. He was, a, he was a singer. Packed his plane too heavy of equipment. Somebody told him, hey, man, that plane won't be able to carry all that equipment. And he ignored it. And I want to say, I could be wrong, but I want to say he was like, oh, God will take care of us. Well, you need to know you heard from the Lord. Unfortunately, God did not take care of him. Even though God did take care of him by telling him through another person, there's too much equipment on the plane. And it brought the plane down and killed the guy. I'm not saying walk with your head down and just whatever you speak will come to you, hocus pocus, magic, and if God doesn't do it, then that's on him. I'm talking about being led by the Spirit, your new reality, being led by the Spirit. Now, somebody say seek. So the Bible says seek. It means put a demand. It means to aim at, to seek for, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Set your sights on the realities of heaven. Now, there's a lot to this that I am going to continue to unpack in the weeks to come, God willing. My desire for you today is I want you to leave here with a hunger and a craving to want to seek the kingdom of God. Being led by the Holy Spirit. Now, you don't have to pray, God, if it's your will for me to seek the kingdom, then, no, Jesus already said to seek the kingdom. So the door is wide open for you to seek. The door is wide open for you. But it's up to you. I can't seek the kingdom for you. But what happens is oftentimes people look to other people and they see the blessing and favor of God on their life and they scratch their head, why, why am I not walking in that? Well. They're seeking the kingdom. While many people are seeking a boss or seeking a position or seeking a marriage or seeking a family or seeking a spouse or seeking a job or seeking a whatever. He didn't say seek a spouse. He didn't say seek a marriage. He didn't say seek your children. Is this making sense? He didn't say seek your job and figure out 15 ways to build it. 17 growth principles to a successful business. What did he say? Seek what? Seek the kingdom. And as you seek the kingdom, God will download on how to treat your spouse better. God will, and oftentimes when God tells you how to treat your spouse better, it starts with conviction for you. He begins to show you how you've been treating your spouse not how your spouse has been treating you. Oh, I'm preaching a lot better than I'm getting amens right now. I know it ain't a hyped up message, but it's the truth. As you begin to seek God, he'll begin to unpack strategic prophetic ideas for your business. He'll begin to give you prophetic words for people at work. Seek the kingdom and your righteousness. And this is what we're going to lay in this plane today. I want to show you something that God was showing me the other day. I want you to go with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. And this is where we're going to close, all right? Matthew 11.
Set your sights on the realities of heaven. Now, if you dishonor your parents, God is not obligated. He's not bound to covenant if you disobey. Anything we do willfully or even not knowingly. Jesus says to honor your father and mother. Doesn't matter how old they are, doesn't matter your relationship with them. You can still honor them. All right? There's, there's secret principles that Bishop David Oyedepo teaches that God's been using him to speak to me and help me grow in that I want to be able to teach you and help you grow in. Husbands, if you do not treat your wives the way Jesus treats the church, God is not bound to follow through on his end of the deal. Now, you, you may make it to heaven, but as far as walking on this side, we're talking about on this side of eternity right now. That's what we're talking about. God, let your reality become my reality. How is it? It's a spiritual transaction. It's a spiritual thing. You live life in the spirit. You're led by the spirit, all right? So if you don't treat your wives right, then God's not bound to bless you. And wives, if you don't submit to your husbands, God is not bound to bless you. Are you with me? It's really important. Dads, if we don't treat our kids right, God is not bound to bless us. The Bible actually says if we treat our wives harshly, our prayers will be hindered. How many prayers have been hindered because of a husband going on some ego, prideful, arrogant anger streak against their spouse? And then we get mad at God and frustrated when God's not following through. God's not bound to follow through if we disobey his word. And here's the deal. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You can't, the excuse doesn't fly. Well, I didn't know. He's going to say, I gave you a Bible, didn't I? Yeah, you did. Why didn't you read it? Well, I just got busy. Well, that's on you. You can't listen to the same teachings over and over again and expect to grow in knowledge. It's not how it works. Give yourself to the whole word. Give yourself to the whole thing. Don't just give yourself to the four same teachings you've heard since you were a child. Salvation. All that's great. It's important. To walk in the blessings, you've got to be saved. You've got to give your life to Jesus. But it's, it's more than that. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that's a mouthful, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, say that 10 times fast, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that you are a royal priesthood. In other words, look up here for a moment, you are royalty. When you said yes to Jesus, you became royal. Now, how does a prince and a princess walk around? Defeated? Or do they walk around in fine clothing as if, they know who they are. Eric, listen, confidence is arrogance to somebody who's insecure. Who do they think they are confident? Obviously, you're insecure for thinking that. Who do they think they are? When we get that kind of perspective on people who are going after Jesus, now, are people who are going after Jesus arrogant? Yeah, a lot of them are. But a lot of them aren't. What's our job? Not to judge. Our job's to love and to be secure. Let's focus less on what other ministers and other people are doing. You ever see these YouTube, these stupid YouTube videos, which, man, I'm telling you right now, these guys who are hating on other ministers, that is a scary place to be in. I wouldn't want to be there in their shoes for a second. The judgment of God can come on them. The Bible says, do not touch the Lord's anointed. You have these people out there thinking they are like God's judge. They're like a God's judge out there to tell all the world who to listen to and who not to listen to. That is a scary place to be in. Don't ever fall into that trap. Let me just name a few because a lot of us have heard these names. And if you've judged them, you need to repent. Joel Olstein, Benny Hinn, Jesse Duplantis, Kenneth Copeland, all these well-known ministers. There might be other ministers you're thinking of. It doesn't matter what your thoughts are on them. It's not for us to say that God has not touched them with an anointing. Do not touch. You know what King David did to the one who killed King Saul? King Saul, listen to this. King Saul 
tried to kill David. King Saul goes to a battle. I believe he was wounded, so another man came to help him by killing him. And the same man went to King David and said, King David, King Saul is now dead. And King David said, who killed him? And the man said, I did. And you know what King David did to that guy? King David had him killed. He said, do not touch the Lord's anointed. Now, what did King David know that a lot of Americans need to grow in? He understood honor. He understood God anointed King Saul. Even though King Saul had his weaknesses and his imperfections, King Saul was trying, King David at that moment could have said, finally, whoo, don't have to worry about King Saul trying to kill me now. But King David said, how dare you touch the Lord's anointed? We are not a church and we will not be a church that, touch any, that, that touches any ministers. Let God be the one to judge them. We will be the ones to keep our mouth closed and we will honor them. Jesus said, if they're not preaching against me, they're with me. Just because they're not preaching what you would like or I would like for them to preach does not mean it's our job now to begin to dishonor. I don't know who this is for today, but I just, I'm passionate about it right now. It is not our job. I'm dealing with a spiritual thing right now in the atmosphere and a spiritual thing on the inside of people's hearts. It's not our job to point the finger and say, they're not a man of God or a woman of God because of X, Y, Z. You better watch it. If that's you, I would repent yesterday. I, I would make it so quick to, hum- if you've dishonored your mom and dad, I would make it so quick to humble yourself and say, God, forgive me, because your word says, do not dishonor my mother and father. Well, yeah, they beat me. They, it doesn't matter. They are your mother and father. God's word will not contradict itself where, oh, you got abused by your parents? Okay, it's okay to slander them and bash them. I I didn't know that. I know it's a sensitive topic. I know it hurts. But I sense by the spirit I'm hitting a nerve right now. You want to walk in full kingdom reality? You've got to honor the word of God in its fullness. You will walk in the fullness you want to walk in. If you want to walk around justifying why you're dishonoring, disrespectful, whatever the case may be, whoever this is for, if it's for one person, so be it. Don't get mad at God. Point the finger right back at yourself and say, Father, I humble myself in your presence. Bring me into a place of brokenness and repentance. Holy Spirit's breathing on this right now. Honor is protocol in the kingdom of heaven. Honor is protocol. Honor is protocol. Honor is protocol. Honor is protocol. We're gonna land this plane right here. Stand to your feet with me. I'm not even gonna get to Matthew. I just want you to stand to your feet. I want you to close your eyes all over this place. I want you to ask yourself, where in your life have you been disobedient? Where in your life do you need to Repent and let Holy Spirit bring refreshing to your soul. Where right, I didn't plan to go in this direction, but I sense by the Spirit, this is where he's wanting us to go. So right now, where in your life? Husbands, I wanna talk to you for a moment. If you've been dishonoring at all this week alone and you have yet to ask your spouse for forgiveness, I'm talking to you. Wives, if you at all have been dishonoring and unsubmissive to your husbands, I'm talking to you. If anybody in this room has been dishonoring to their their parents, I'm talking to you. Even if your parents already passed away, but you still talk about them, or you have talked about them, and you have yet to ask God to forgive you, I'm talking to you. If you have bashed any minister in the world, doesn't matter what you found out about them, doesn't matter what the news media said, doesn't matter what's true and what is not true. If you have bashed any minister at all and you have not repented for it, I'm talking to you. God cares about you so much that he's given you an opportunity right now to make things right with him. 
Oftentimes we equate sin to fornication and drugs and alcohol and pornography and and cussing and bad attitudes. But right now, I sense strong by the Spirit, he's dealing with a major issue that many people overlook and they justify why they are dishonoring to many different kinds of people. Honor is protocol in the kingdom. And to be a royal son and a royal daughter, you must honor. Holy Spirit will begin to give you a greater desire for honor and he will bring conviction into your world by telling you, don't say that. Don't talk about them. Keep that mouth shut. Don't do that. Don't do that. I sense his presence right now. Father, I thank you for brokenness that's taking place throughout this congregation right now. Father, you don't care how often we go to church more than you care about being Christ-like. You care more about us becoming more like Jesus than saying, well, I went to church today. If you've been degrading, if you've been dishonoring, whatever the case is, I know I'm hitting this straight between the eyes right now. Wives, if you've been talking behind your husband's backs, if you go to your parents and badmouth your spouse, if you aggravate your children where they get angry at you, all of these things are protocols in the kingdom of heaven that God is calling you up higher because he loves you. He wants you to walk in his fullness, but you have to yield. And you've got to say, Holy Spirit, bring me in. Father, forgive me. Your true identity does not dishonor. Your true identity does not have a dirty mouth. Your true identity is pure and holy and blameless. And God is calling your soul to be renewed through the reading of the word and by repentance. Every eye closed, if you say that's me, let me see your hand right where you are. Say you're talking to me. Hallelujah. I see a few hands. Who else say you're talking to me? Every eye closed. I'm not wanting to dishonor anybody. I'm wanting to give you a chance, and God's wanting to give you a chance to make things right with him. Come on, who are you? Say, man, my heart's beating fast. I know God's dealing with me right now. Come on, raise it up. If you've already raised your hand, you can put it down. Who else say that's me? You want to make things right with God right now. This is important to him. It's very important to him. God's wanting to elevate you, but you have to do it on his terms. You can't overlook these things that we consider as small. They're very big in his eyes. Treat your wives the way Jesus treats the church. Wives, submit to your husband. Dads, do not aggravate your kids to anger. Who here has blown up on their children and you've yet to repent of it? Let me see your hand. You say, that's me. I, I, I need God to help me in this, this area of anger and being easily irritated and aggravated. I see your hand. There's a man here and you struggle with this. And even right now, you feel very uncomfortable because you know by the spirit I'm talking to you. Who are you? If you want freedom, it's here for you right now. God doesn't care how much money you give to the church. If you verbally abuse your children, God is not pleased with that action. He cares about your heart, not about your wallet. Who are you? 
God has given you a chance right now to make things right with him. Who in here has been dishonoring to their parents? You blame your parents for why you are the way you are, and you justify not going all in and making things right with God. Today's a chance for you. Let me see your hand if that's you. I see your hand. Anybody else? I see your hand. Anybody else? I see your hand. Anybody else? Come on, you're a new creation now. You are no longer the byproduct of your upbringing. You are now in a new kingdom. Identify with your new kingdom, and you will become more royal. Not that the blood of Jesus doesn't make us royal enough. You'll begin to understand how royal you really are. How you carry yourself, how you think about yourself, how you interact with people. There's a confidence about you. There's a security about you. You get your trust from the Lord. You put your trust in the Lord. He brings you in. Come on, God cares about you seeing yourself as a royal son and daughter. Who in here has been struggling with that? You don't see yourself as a royal son or a royal daughter. Maybe you see yourself more as like a peasant. More as like a victim. Who are you? Let me see your hand. You say, it's me. Come on, God's talking to people right now. You don't see yourself as a royal son and a royal daughter. Hallelujah. I see your hand. Anybody else? Say, it's me. How many of you guys say you want to start seeing yourself as a royal son and a royal daughter? You want to grow in that and you want to see yourself as that. I see your hand. Anybody else? Say, it's me. I want to grow as a royal son. I see your hand. Anybody else? Say, I want to grow in this. I want to, I want to see myself the way God sees me. In the spirit, with your eyes closed, let me tell you how God sees you right now. God sees you as sanctified. You and God, you have right standing with him. Now, if you've got a sin in your life, you need to repent of it, and we're going to do that in just a moment. Once that happens, you're going to be in right standing with the Lord. Your conscience is going to be cleared, and there's going to be a confidence that comes to you. This is what happens. You're going to move in power and in authority. I want you to see yourself as this. Close your eyes and imagine yourself. Imagine yourself loving people without strings attached. Imagine yourself looking at people as to what you can get to them, not what you can get from them. That's what royalty does. You look at being the blessing, not I need a blessing. You yourself are the blessing. This is royalty. The the king, our king, is not looking to us to take care of him. Rather, he wants us to look to him for him to take care of us. Full reliance, full dependence on the Lord. Come on, I want you to see yourself as bold. See yourself as confident. See yourself as a man and a woman of faith. Really, you're a child. We're all children in the kingdom of God. I got to fully rely on God. I cannot do this by myself. Holy Spirit, bring them in. 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 If you raised your hand, and you need to repent of any sin in your life, I want to lead you in this prayer right now. And before I do that, if you're here and you've yet to give your life completely and totally to Jesus Christ, and you want to do that right now, I want to see your hand. You say, man, I want to fully surrender my life to Jesus. Let me see your hand. One, two, three. Put it up right where you are. Let me see who you are. You want to fully give your life to Jesus. You've never done it before, and you want to make heaven your home and Jesus your master and Lord and Savior. If that's you, raise your hand right where you are. If you need to rededicate your life to the Lord today, maybe you're here, but you have not been serving him. 
You've fallen back into sin, but today God's calling you back home. You're a prodigal son or you're a prodigal daughter. And you want to give your life back to Jesus today. Let me see your hand. One, two, three. Put it up right where you are. Man, I want to give my life back to Jesus. I want to say yes. I want to follow him. Hallelujah. Say this with me. Everybody all across this room, say it with a conviction on the inside. Say, Jesus, you're the great example. I can't do this on my own. Human effort accomplishes nothing. I need to be brought in by Holy Spirit. I can't do this on my own. I don't want to do this on my own. It's got to be a supernatural thing. Father, I ask for your forgiveness for being dishonoring to my husband, to my wife, to my children, to those in authority to ministers of the gospel. Father, forgive me for becoming a judge when that's not what you've called me to be. You've called me to love. You've called me to seek the kingdom. You've called me to seek righteousness, which is right standing with you. So I'll lock eyes with you right now. Holy Spirit, bring me in. Jesus, Wash me with your blood. Purify my mind. Purify my heart. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, I need you. Holy Spirit, I need you. Father, I set my sights on the realities of heaven. I set my sights on the realities of heaven. I set my sights on my identity, on this new nature, on this spirit being, which I am a spirit being. My soul will no longer control me. My carnality will no longer control me. My new identity in Christ, that is what will control me. Holy Spirit, my ears are open. My eyes are ready. My eyes are open. I want to see what you see. I want to hear what you hear. Father, I want to feel what you feel. Say this with me. Say, Father, the moment I said yes to you, I became a royal son. I became a royal daughter. I am royalty. Now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, through the blood of Jesus, enable me to see myself as royalty as I set my sights on the realities of heaven. Now let Holy Spirit minister to you right where you are. I call forth royal sons and royal daughters out of this house that will do damage for the kingdom of heaven. Royal sons, royal daughters, royal sons, royal daughters. Your new reality is the kingdom of God, no longer what you see with your natural eye. Bring us in, Holy Spirit. Bring us in, Holy Spirit. Bring us in, Holy Spirit. Show us the access that we have. Show us the access that we have. Through the blood, by the Spirit, through the blood, by the Spirit. Hallelujah. 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 God wants you to be debt free. God wants your body 
to be free of physical disease and pain. Come on, you're powerful in the spirit. Royalty, royalty, royalty. Seek, seek, seek. To aim, to crave. Seek first the kingdom. Look up here for a moment. Somebody say protocol. Now, if you do not abide in kingdom protocol, you cannot expect the blessing from abiding in kingdom protocol. If I go into your house and you, one of your rules is to take the shoes off when somebody walks in, guess what protocol is? Take your shoes off. Does it matter if I like to take my shoes off or not? That's the protocol of your house. The protocol of God's house, in other words, his kingdom, there's a list of protocols. That's why this series, it's got to be a series. You can't squeeze it all in to an hour or two hours. Really what this is, is this is a lifestyle. It's more, oh, so much more than than a series. This is to entice you by the Spirit to bring you in to who you really are and what you can walk in and what you can have on this side of eternity. Jesus did not send his son for us to see ourselves as orphans. He sent his son so that we can become mature children of God. Not weak-minded believers that are victims that are struggling on this side of eternity. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. For this world, it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So you have to see yourself as royal. Bring the music down. This is what happens. We see somebody else that has more money, that looks like they have nicer things, and then we think to ourselves, well, I have nothing to offer them. Because in the natural, yet again, we look at the natural thing. But when you start seeing yourself as a royal son and a royal daughter. What does that mean? That means you start abiding by kingdom protocol and you actually believe that you are God's royalty. You're not just a Christian. Many Americans believe I'm just a Christian. Just waiting for Jesus to come take the rapture. Just a Christian. You are so much more than just a Christian. You think Jesus came just to make you a Christian? That's most important. That way you make it to heaven, you don't burn in hell for eternity. But there's so much more he's calling you into. When you have children, you've got a responsibility now to teach them protocol. You say, yes, ma'am. You say, no, ma'am. You say, yes, sir. You say, no. It's It's called maturity. It's respect. It's honor. You teach them. Teach them how to dress themselves. Clothe yourself with humility. God doesn't say, I'll clothe you with humility. The Bible says, clothe yourself. What is it? He's teaching, he's teaching you how to dress yourself. David says, there's a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. I'm, I have an eight-year-old son. I don't still feed him his food. We taught him how to eat. Kingdom protocol. Eat. Have your protocol. You can be as full in the spirit and as drunk in the spirit as you want to be. But if you leave here today and you go back to the life you live, for some maybe even this past week, and you just live life in your own little world, and you don't begin to feast on kingdom next Sunday, you'll, you'll live your whole week back to church next Sunday, which many American Christians do. They just they just go from one church service to another church service, one Sunday to another Sunday, and their whole week they feel defeated and live defeated and they're struggling, and they come back in to get a refreshing word and experience the presence of God, and then they go back out into their week just living defeated. Is that why Jesus died? It 
it's okay to ask questions. I don't know about you, Jesus, though, didn't die just for me to become a Christian and make it to heaven. He died so that I could spend eternity with him. But he also died so that I could become like him and become a mature son in the kingdom. Not an adult, but a son. A son. Somebody say a son. A daughter. Maturity protocol. You'll walk in authority. At the same time, humility. Authority doesn't mean you're rude. You walk in authority and humility together. You, you understand that nobody controls your joy. Nobody dictates your level of spiritual development. You determine how much you want to grow in the kingdom. Nobody determines that for you but you. You can grow as much as you want to grow. Sometimes God lets you grow as fast as you want to grow. Other times he takes you through a process and you're on his timeline. But nonetheless, God, his desire for you is to grow and be mature. Amen? Amen. Say, I'm royalty. So no more saying I've been defeated. No more saying I've been struggling. Do the words coming out of your mouth line up with the words in this book? You're not defeated. Your struggling days are over today. From this day forward, you speak nothing but life. You speak nothing but life. You speak nothing but life. The fact is, you may have physical pain in your body. The truth is, your spirit being who you really are is healed, sanctified, covered by the blood, and you lean and trust Holy Spirit. And you say, Father, thank you for healing this physical body. This physical body isn't really me, but you care and you died for my healing. Hallelujah. You cared and you, you bled for my healing. Amen? Amen. Now I want you to get the communion cup. Hopefully all of you guys received one when you came in. If not, raise your hand. We'll have one of our team members get one to you if you need communion. Hallelujah. Amen. In it, you're going to find some juice and you're going to find a little wafer. We're going to take it together in just a moment. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. I am. John 1 says, Jesus is the word. The word became flesh. So when you read the word, you're reading and spiritually eating the bread of life. Proverbs says, that the word of God brings healing to your bones. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Hearing the word of God. Hearing the word of God. This word does not return unto God void. Your eyes get open to revelation through the reading of the word. Through the hearing of the word. We're not just taking a wafer. What we're taking, this represents the body of Jesus, which hung on a cross. This represents the word of God, which is Jesus itself, Jesus himself. The Bible says that God made Jesus wisdom itself. If you understand what you're taking here, what it will do, is the impact and the value of this is much greater. We're not just taking away from it. This represents the body. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. It represents my body. Two men were on the road with Jesus. They called the road to Emmaus. They got to their destination. He broke the bread. And when he broke the bread, their eyes were open. And they realized it was Jesus with them the whole time. When you go home and you break open the bread, the reading of scripture, that's when Holy Spirit begins to bring you into greater revelation. Some of you today received revelation. And it's what that is, it's just an enticement from the Lord in a good way to bring you in. He's trying to bring you in. He's trying to bring you in. He longs for you to grow. 
He desires for you to grow. Amen? Crave the word of God. Father, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die for us. We take this wafer that represents your body, Lord Jesus. This represents, Father, your word. This represents wisdom. This represents, Lord, what you've done for us. Your word does not return to you void. The word of the Lord stands forever. And we take this in faith and in trust, believing and taking you at your word. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Let's take it together. This cup right here represents the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Romans says, put your faith in the blood. Put your faith in the blood. By his stripes you were healed. He bore your sicknesses. Bore means he carried them far off. Far off. Far off. If you got sickness in your body today, your mind can easily try to talk you out of what Jesus did for you. That's why you got to put your faith in what he did. Thank you, Jesus. You took this sickness far away from me. I put your faith in that. I put my faith in that, rather. I put my faith in your word. I put my faith in your blood. It was shed. His blood was shed. One drop of the blood of Jesus is more powerful than Satan and all the demons that follow him. The blood of Jesus is the love of God in liquid form. Hallelujah. And we take this to remember what Jesus did for us and to refocus, we, we, we set our sights on the blood. Can I hear an amen? Jesus, we thank you for your blood. We thank you it was shed for us. I plead the blood over Hunt County. I plead the blood over every marriage in this room. I plead the blood over every family, over every child. I plead the blood over every business. I plead the blood right now, Jesus, over every person that's got sickness in their physical body. I command that sickness to leave in the name of Jesus by the power of the blood. And we thank you, Lord, for your blood. We thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood for us. We get our power from the blood of Jesus. And I thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Let's take it together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just close your eyes one more time and just say, Father, thank you for your blood. Thank you for your son's blood. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your body. We love you. We honor you. We celebrate you, King Jesus. You're so good to us. We praise your holy name. We praise your holy name. We praise your holy name. If you got sickness in your body, just receive by faith your healing. Just say, Father, I receive my healing right now. I thank you that this sickness is being driven out of my body right now in Jesus' name.